Hello, and welcome to Autology, the podcast that brings you the latest on automotive technology. This week's episode is about CES 2024, and you're here with me, Kyle Davis, Senior Analyst for Connected Car and Vehicle Experience. I'll be joined by Brock Walquist, Senior Analyst for ADAS and Autonomy, to discuss his views on the show. And then we'll be joined by Iqbal Archad, Chief Technology Officer of Serence, to discuss Gen AI. Brock, how are you doing today? Great, Kyle, and great to be back from Vegas after a, a busy week at CES 2024. Yes, yes, it was busy as it always is, but it's always a, a good time there. Um, so from your point of view, how did CES 2024 build on the past year and CES 2023? That's a, that's a great way to start this. And, you know, thinking back to CES 2023, being on the ground, all, all you could hear was something about a software defined vehicle. <laughs> um, you know, the, the obvious trend of electrification was, was already well underway. Um, and we, we were able to see some of that in action then as well. Um, but software defined vehicle being a central term in 2023 that it felt like could mean everything and nothing at all depending on who you talk to and i'm i'm sure as you saw this year um all of all of that that trending towards a software defined vehicle and electrification really went from talking points and you know a, a vision really into you know execution and how can we you know, from a supply chain perspective, how can we leverage our expertise to support our automaker partners? And with that, you know, of, of, of course, you and I being focused on, um, you know, certain technology areas, you know, you see all of this new technology, you know, impacting the in-vehicle experience due to, you know, the software defined nature of vehicles, the impacts that that then has on new vehicle architectures, uh, next generation concepts. And therefore, you know, for, from my perspective, a continued growth and, and focus on automated driving and, you know, going from vehicles really being focused on safety technologies and now all of these different convenience uh, focus technology is really at paramount for uh, many suppliers and, and automakers that we talk to. So I'll flip this one right back to you, Kyle. Um, you know, what, what, did, what did you notice about CES 2024 and um, how did that build on the past year from, mm -hmm. from your perspective? Yeah, I feel like you were uh, looking at my show notes um, because mine is also around software to find people. <laughs> um, it, it felt like last year that it, as you mentioned, you know, everyone was mentioning software defined vehicle and everyone knew how big, um, you know, of a concept and trend this is going to grow to be. But I don't think there was a lot of tangible products out there um, in CES 2023. Um, CES 2024, however, um, saw a number of different solutions around software defined vehicle, especially as it, you know, relates to helping the OEM. One major tier one supplier, Morelli, was saying that with their digital twin concept, uh, for software defined vehicles that can reduce time to market and cost um, by 70%. Um, so that from the time they actually get awarded a contract to the time that they can uh, be confident in the vehicle starting production, it takes about a year, um, which is obviously very advantageous for OEMs moving forward. I do have another trend that I'd like to kind of relate to software defined vehicles, and, and that's Gen AI. I feel like you couldn't pass a booth this year um, without seeing the the two letters AI attached to the booth. And, and I feel like it really relates back to how we felt about software defined vehicles in 2023. Um, obviously, when we're talking about AI, there's some numerous use cases from the user and the end consumer. Um, especially as it relates to virtual personal assistance, potentially, you know, some owner manuals, um, you know, being able to help the end consumer, but actually seeing how that's going to impact and help OEMs and tier ones develop and increase, um, you know, time to market while decreasing costs is still something um, I'd like to see a little more of, um, you know, in the coming year as we lead into CES 2025. Um, so moving on here, um, obviously your expertise is in ADAS and autonomous driving. Um, so what kind of trends did you see as it relates to both of those areas? I touched on this a little bit before, um, a continued shift from, you know, past CESs going back to even CES 2020, where there was, you know, a, a flying vehicle concept uh, that I can think back on. There being far less focus on concepts and really looking at execution and, you know, delivering viable products in the near term for uh, for OEM partners. And so, you know, when we focus that on 
ADAS and automated driving. We think about how the industry has you know, well penetrated ADAS systems uh, across most most vehicles that are coming to market these days. Um, you know, thinking about level zero and level one technologies, automatic emergency braking, blind spot systems. And even looking at the growth of something like adaptive cruise control, which consumers find incredibly valuable. But now, you know, taking that a step further and into automated driving, uh, looking at you know, level two systems, level two plus systems, these, you know, highly convenience oriented technologies, really seeing the supply chain position themselves to support that business. And as, as we touched on, uh, with the software defined vehicle, there being this potential OTA angle that that automakers are making strategic decisions around of, you know, I can bring a vehicle to market as a level two plus system, let's say, and as regulation, liability, and overall comfort with deploying a certain technology, you know, reach an OEM's threshold of comfort, then we can increase the functionality of these vehicles for, for our customers for our um, consumers. So really around, you know, camera and radar, well penetrated technologies dating back many, many years. But we're seeing, you know, next generations of those higher resolution, higher distances that they're able to to perceive different things in in their environment. And also production ready LIDAR, I think. I think that's a that's a big one here. Going around we were able to see both of the level three approved vehicles in the world um, around the CES show floor uh, with the BMW i7 at the Innovis booth uh, and also Mercedes showing the the EQS as well, both LiDAR enabled vehicles. Uh, but you saw Luminar with, with another year of showcasing a, a new vehicle at their booth. And you're really starting to see the maturity of as, as OEMs are making decisions to jump into highly automated and capable vehicles. Um, you know, now the, the LiDAR supply chain is far better positioned to, to support that sort of vision and, and aspirations that, that automakers have. So with that, you know, flipping it back to connectivity and vehicle experience, uh, what were big things that you noticed on the show floor, Kyle? Yeah, I already kind of touched on the high level trends of software defined vehicle and Gen AI, uh, maybe expanding a little bit on software defined vehicle. Um, numerous large tier one companies such as Morelli and Continental had uh, digital twins that were, you know, uh, showcased at their booths. And what I really found interesting about this is not only how it can help the OEM in tier one improve time to market and cost, but also how it can impact and enhance the end user experience. Continental's digital twin, for example, it was given the ability for the user to choose a couple of different interests they might have, whether it be sports, whether it be art, whether it be, you know, a thrill adventure. Um, and they can do that via the smartphone. And then that way, when they get in the vehicle cabin, these trends and interests that they have um, are already, you know, being impacted by their experience. So the example that Continental gave was that for a thrill seeker in Las Vegas, they had a number of different attractions that the consumer can choose from, whether it be dune surfing, whether it be a couple of roller coasters in the area, uh, whether it be going up on the stratosphere, which is something I would never do. Um, it, it's just interesting to see how these tier ones, you know, keep innovating to try to, you know, really improve that end user experience. So that was definitely a trend from the connected car and vehicle experience side that I wanted to highlight. Uh, another would be a little bit around displays. You know, I don't think it's a secret that OEMs have a less presence at CES compared to previous years, especially before the pandemic. Um, so we're not seeing all of these production vehicles at CES with all of these large displays. I think it was at CES either 2018 or 2019 when Byton really stole the headlines uh, with their 48 inch display. Um, we're not really seeing that as much anymore for a couple of key reasons. Number one, I think OEMs and consumers are becoming more used to these larger displays entering the vehicle, especially in the domestic Chinese market. So it's not really, you know, particular, you know, interest or, you know, doesn't really generate a lot of media buzz as it used to in the past. But what we are seeing from the display side is a lot of display innovation, especially as it relates to transparency and different kind of displays. Continental had their crystal clear, um, display that they partnered with Svorsky on. 
um, which was 10 inches and it was transparent, which was very neat to see, as well as Hyundai Mobis did um, also exhibit a transparent display. Um, so instead of really size and curvature, we're starting to see more display characteristics being developed by tier ones. Also from my point of view, Brock, I think there seemed to be a little bit of a smaller presence of autonomous vehicle concepts and AV companies at CES this year. Um, why do you think that is? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a great question and uh, a million dollar question in many ways, you know, figuratively and literally for all the investment that has gone on in the AV space over the last, you know, 10 plus years. Overall, I think there's this year it really showed at CES. Uh, but overall, over the past few years, there's really been a realignment of expectations around, you know, level four and beyond capable AVs. You know, some of the shifted expectations around whether this can happen for a personally owned car versus mobility as a service concept. Now we really see that market leaning into more mobility as a service concepts. And then, you know, you see this really a roller coaster of of news depending on when you're when you when you're reading a news publication around AVs of good news when it comes to you know new capabilities approvals you know successes and you know then you see the the negative side of incidents and different accidents that come with you know learning teaching these autonomous vehicles how to function in in society without having someone that's you know used to certain scenarios there to to guide the way so I think this overall realignment of expectations has has really, you know, worked its way down into CES and even into the supply chain as I've as, as I've talked about with automated driving. We have a big focus on automated driving, um, you know, especially that level two plus area, uh, which seems to be a sweet spot for many OEMs thinking, you know, Super Cruise and Blue's Cru Blue Cruise as it relates to Ford and GM. But also, you know, when we think about the supply chain, one of one of the most common things you hear is scalable hardware and software solutions. So, you know, software, of course, we've we've harped on software defined vehicle plenty, you know, just in the last 15 minutes or so. But from a hardware perspective as well, positioning themselves to say, okay, you know, if you want to, if an automaker partner wants to go to market at level two, we have the ability to support that. And if they so have the goal and objective to, you know, work from level two on up to level three and beyond, you know, our sensors are, ca are capable of doing that but you know we're really going to leave it in the automakers hands or you know the technology providers hands when it comes to uh, some of these mobility as a service companies so yeah I think I think this realignment of expectations is continuing to kind of set the tone around around level four I still think there's plenty of cautious optimism as well um, you know a lot of the deployments we see are highly geographically limited at the moment um, you know very specific cities. Um, you know, difficulty expanding into other cities. So it'll be, it'll definitely, you know, require some patience moving forward. But I think that's a lot of why, you know, we see a smaller AV presence at, at CES 2024. And then from my view, as it, you know, as it goes into your realm of the world, you, you mentioned Byte and that's a, that's a, that's a great example of a pre previous CES real highlight mm -hmm. where displays are, were so big there for a stretch, but it seems like they're getting a little bit less media attention with, with every CES. Would you agree with that? And, you know, overall, if you do agree with that, why do you think that is? Mm -hmm. Yeah, as I previously mentioned, you know, I think a lot of it has to do with OEMs not coming back to the show in full force as they were pre-pandemic. I think we also in the automotive industry, you know, we're too deep in the weeds and we have to think about the average consumer. Um, and I, I think that for the average consumer, it's a lot easier to resonate, you know, with a display innovation or a new display in an OEM's, you know, portfolio, whether it be, you know, Ford, Byte, and General Motors, you know, the list goes on. Um, but it's a little, little different when, you know, you're highlighting the technology um, from a tier one or maybe a smaller tier two that the general public really isn't too familiar with. Um, so I think that's why they're receiving a little bit less media attention. But as I mentioned, you know, the innovation is, is still there around displays. One of the big themes from the vehicle experience side that I saw this year was the, the rise of what we call P HUDs or panoramic HUDs. Um, a number of tier ones, you know, had this at their booths, including Visteon, 
uh, including Harmon, um, which is basically just a really thin display that covers the A pillar to A pillar, and it's closer to the driver's line of sight. One tier one said that as it relates to a consumer survey they ran, uh, consumers were preferring the P HUD um, at a two to one clip over an augmented reality head up display. Now, is that just because augmented reality head up displays really haven't become too prevalent in the vehicle and consumers really don't know the benefit? That remains to be seen. Um, but it's definitely the industry as a whole, as it relates to displays, are still innovating um, at, at a pretty good rate for displays and trying to enhance that user experience at the end of the day. All right, Brock. Great. Thank you. Now I'd like to welcome Iqbal Arshad to the podcast. Iqbal is the Chief Technology Officer of Serence and here to discuss Gen AI with us today. Thanks, Iqbal, for joining. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, and uh, thank you for having me on this podcast. Of course, of course, should be a fun discussion around Gen AI, which was a very major topic here at CES. Um, so we'll start with a big announcement that your company, Serence, uh, made with Volkswagen around Gen AI at CES. Can you go into some more detail about the announcement? Yeah, we're really excited about our, uh, the work that we're doing with Volkswagen. Um, the announcement uh, was about our first product on our AI roadmap, and uh, it specifically addresses a lot of enhancements in VW's IDA assistant that they offer through all of their cars. And what we have done with VW is created um, an AI system where majority of the assistant transactions are within the Serence cloud. And then we also use large language models for reasoning as well as as general knowledge questions. So what does this really mean? Uh, first, if I am a user in a VW car, now I'm able to have a much more conversational uh, user interface versus just telling commands. And if I'm outside the commands that the system has been trained on typically, then I have errors. But with this new conversational user interface, people don't need to know any commands. They can just have a conversation. So for example, one of the things that you would typically do in a car is uh, change your climate control. So in this case, with the power of the conversational assistant, you can just say I'm cold instead of saying like adjust the temperature to 75 degrees. So that's just one example where all the car related functions are much, much easier to control via voice versus you fiddling with a touchscreen or any kind of buttons while you're driving, right? And, and what we're trying to do is reduce the cognitive load and all this attention switching that typically drivers do. Another really cool example is that if, let's say when we were in Las Vegas, um, I always uh, like to go out and eat Indian cuisine. Um, I, instead of entering a destination address in, into my navigation system, I can just tell the computer my intent. So, so in that example, I would just simply say that I want to eat butter chicken. And then we're using large language model reasoning to go out and find the nearest Indian restaurant. Note that I did not say Indian restaurant, but it would understand my intent through AI reasoning and find all the closest and the best restaurants near me. And then directly my navigation would allow me to navigate there. So these, there's many examples of these kinds of more conversational intersection. And then the last example I would give is that you, there are so many interesting use cases that Volkswagen's working on. So, you know, if you have younger kids in the back and you want them to read a dinosaur story or you're going for an interview and you want to know specific information about a company, you can just simply ask the assistant to give you that information. And in some cases, like story, it will actually generate a story using generative AI computing. And then I would end with another interesting thing we're doing with Volkswagen is that you want to make sure that the AI is uh, safe and it's equitable. So we allow VW to filter out certain kind of political or religious content, which whatever they think is appropriate, inappropriate content and they can also customize the way that the AI can respond. So let's say if you were asking AI who makes the best cars, in this case, uh, we are, uh, VW can design their own response because obviously they want you know the AI to say that VW is making the best car. So overall, it's a step forward in the actual user experience for their assistant and we're very happy to be part of it. Yeah, that's great. Thanks for the explanation there. It definitely seems like a great solution for OEMs provided the flexibility that you give them um, for some specific responses. 
Um, so when is actually the, the gen AI activated in the vehicle? So is it like constantly giving you commands or is there, you know, a certain time frame or a situation, I should say, when the gen AI is activated? Yeah, that's a really great question. If you activate Gen AI for every query, one, it's going to be very costly because as you know that every Gen AI query uses very valuable compute resources, especially on the GPU side. So what we've done is we've designed an intelligent processing system where we look at the intent and in the Serens cloud, we have a number of applications and domains. So for example, like, you know, if, you, if you're used to using like large language models, they don't have uh, real-time information as an example, right? So let's say if you were looking for weather, if you were looking for any kind of a stock quote or sports scores or flight information, all of these things are handled within our cloud, including majority of the car functions. What we use the large large language models for and generative AI, as you pointed out, and uh, is for things like reasoning capability. So one thing that generative AI is really good for is almost human-like reasoning. So um, in my example where I wanted to eat butter chicken, um, in that case, we use generative AI to reason user's intent. So I can reason that if somebody wants to eat butter chicken, the reasoning there would be that they want to go to a restaurant and then therefore the LLM would send a specific message to our navigation domain and then we would re uh, we would return the right uh, you know point of interest i.e. restaurants in this case so reasoning is one capability the other one is a generative capability like if you wanted to the the system to just generate a story about dinosaur for your kids, then it would just generate that and that would go out to the generative AI slash LLM systems. And so these are some of the examples where we use LLM when we really need to, but in um, I would say 90 plus percent of the time, um, we have intelligent processing and we also use our own cloud and all the AI that we built into our cloud to uh, deliver that user experience. Perfect. Thank you for the clarification. Um, so every year, S&P Global Mobility runs a consumer survey, um, and I'd like to share a couple of data points with you. Uh, the first being that 37% of consumers prefer to use speech recognition from their smartphone slash smart device. Uh, so think, you know, Amazon Alexa at home, Google Assistant. Um, while only 29% of consumers prefer to use their automaker's speech recognition platform, uh, do you think gener generative AI will increase the preference of consumers to use the automaker's speech platform? Absolutely, um, because you know all the speech platforms you mentioned, either native to the car or native to uh, their smartphones. Um, they're built on um, legacy natural language understanding systems. So they're much smaller models and their ability to have a conversational interface is fairly limited. So there's a lot of uh, user friction with those systems. With generative AI systems, you have these large language models. Uh, one, they can have a conversational interface, right? So a human can talk to a computer and give instructions to a computer by using language. Second, they have excellent reasoning capabilities to interface with all the applications and services. So uh, we believe, and that was our announcement with VW and we're working with a lot of other customers as well, is that by removing this friction point, um, you're going to have a lot more adoption of voice services in the vehicle. Great. Thank you for that detailed explanation there. Um, going back to the consumer survey, 52% of consumers feel that there are more efficient ways to execute tasks in the vehicle, um, such as using touch screens, buttons, knobs, etc., compared to voice. Additionally, another 52% of consumers also think their voice recognition system does not accurately pick up the command or gives the correct answer or action. Uh, will consumers be more satisfied with their voice assistant if it does have Gen AI capability? Yeah, the short answer is yes. And I, there are two challenges for consumers that you pointed out. The first one is about touchscreens. So if you look at all the touchscreen implementation in automobiles today, they are taking majority of the UI interaction model or user interface interaction model, meaning how users interact with the touchscreen is taken from the smartphone design. Now, a smartphone, uh, and I was part and parcel of it, and we were designing it, was uh, that 
the user interface was designed for a screen that was about 12 to 18 inches away from you and you would have your fingers on the screen itself. So you can go from app to app to complete your tasks. Now that paradigm, in fact, does not work in a car especially when you're driving. And when you go from the first layer of the UI to the second and the third layer, it becomes um, a safety issue. And then, you know, when you're driving, you want to complete your task. So there are a lot of friction points in touch screens as well. And then on the voice side, the voice, as I've mentioned before, the main friction point is the ability for users to have a true conversational interface. And then uh, voice itself is not very well integrated with the applications in the car itself. And so the near generative AI systems, they solve these two issues in a very, very seamless way. First, they uh, allow users to have a conversational interface. And then uh, second, through their reasoning capability, they integrate with the apps and services also really well. And so the, the, the overall system becomes much, much more useful. This is why we believe that the, the take-up rate for consumer for generative AI um, in the car is going to be, be very positive. Fantastic answer right there. Um, I have one last question for you, and it's a kind of a loaded one. Um, what do you think the future impact of Gen AI and large language learning models have on the in-car experience? Yeah, so as I was saying before, there are a number of issues that exist in in-car experience today. First, you, you truly have two uh, user experience islands. One is the experience that you're typically able to bring via your phone, via these mirrored applications. And the other one is the native experience that's on your, on your infotainment system. And from a UX standpoint, that is, uh, that is not ideal, especially in driving conditions. Um, the second issue is sometimes you have multiple assistants, and then the third issue is the as more and more physical buttons are being replaced by touchscreen, interacting with touchscreens to do simple things like changing your wiper speed, right? Like when you're driving is very, very complicated. So, and then just also like if you fast forward and you, if you're trying to do a task, for example, if uh, you want to go out to dinner with your wife and you're on your way uh, from work and you want to make a reservation, find out what are good restaurants, and then navigate there and send that information to your wife. Now, just imagine doing that while you're driving. It's nearly impossible with today's system. With Gen AI, next generation system that we're working on with our key partners today, and we we'll hope to you know bring that to market soon as well, we aim to solve the actual user experience where people can have a single conversational thread with the computer and the computer can go across multiple applications to complete users' tasks. And so that's the potential of the generative AI systems that we see in automobiles. And, and effectively, uh, our vision is that every driver or every user in a car will have an AI agent. So that agent will be your mobility agent while you're in the car. It will help you with all car related tasks that as we've been talking about, when you're outside the car also, it'll help you with maintenance, booking maintenance, even ride sharing and all sorts of mobility needs that you may have. And so that's our vision and that's only possible uh, with generative AI. So uh, we think there's a huge potential for automotive OEMs to enhance the user experience inside and outside the car as well. Great. Well, thank you again, Iqbal, for joining the podcast. We really appreciate your insights on the future of voice in the vehicle and how Gen AI will enhance the user experience. Well, thank you for having me, Kyle. And unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. A big thank you to Iqbal and Brock for joining us. And a thank you to all you listeners for tuning in as well. We'd love to hear your thoughts on today's episode at our autology at spglobal.com email. And you can find out much more at autotechinsight.spglobal.com. Don't forget to hit all the subscribe, follow, and like buttons to stay on track with the latest autology podcasts. And we look forward to you joining us again in the next episode. Goodbye for now.